You're listening to the Plastic Ship Podcast. Welcome to the Plastic Ship Podcast. I'm Madhav Malhotra, one of the students at the Plastic Ship, and I'm reaching out to several experts working to solve issues with plastic pollution. This podcast showcases unique perspectives on this massive problem to identify what its most important aspects are. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Martin Medina, who has worked on waste management issues for over 20 years. He's particularly interested in the informal recycling sector in the developing world and is the author of two books and over 50 publications. I'm really excited to hear his perspective on this lesser known side of plastic pollution issues in the developing world. Thank you for joining me today. I know I'm really excited to talk to you because when it comes to the specific uh, problems you've been working on, it's both very unique, plus you have a lot of experiences here. And would it be accurate to say, well, the research you've been doing when it comes to informal waste management, you've been doing it for over two decades now? Yes, that's right. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. When it comes to this, uh, I know like I haven't seen anyone else who has more experience on this. So I thought I could quickly ask you to summarize how you got started working on this issue and your past work or research interests when it comes to this problem? Uh, Yes, when I was a student uh, in the US, I got my master's uh, and then I went on to a a PhD. And I realized that uh, this, uh, the informal recycling sector or waste pickers or scavengers, uh, it it was a topic that very few people had uh, studied. So we had big gaps in knowledge. And I I realized that there were um, Millions, there are actually millions of people living off uh, recovering uh, recyclables from waste. Uh, the mm-hmm. World Bank has estimated that about 1% of the urban population in the developing world survives, you know, by recovering recyclables. So it's, it's an important occupation, important activity that people had just neglected in the past. Academics, uh, students and even professors just it was just a neglected issue and you know even even today even uh, 20 years after I uh, started this there is not a single academic program in the US or in uh, any other country that I know that uh, studies that uh, this uh, informal sector and there are some uh, uh, foundations and some NGOs that are very interested in this topic, that uh, they're uh, involved in um, in some some research and some uh, and some uh, advocacy, uh, but academics are still neglecting this issue. Yeah, and it's a very important one, especially given the context of the challenges in developing countries when it comes to plastic pollution and waste management in general. So when it comes to the informal waste management sectors in uh, many developing countries from in Latin America to uh, Southeast Asia. Could you describe the status quo of the problems that these waste management uh, sectors face? Yes, they face a lot of problems because they, um, uh, in many countries, they are still uh, misunderstood. Authorities usually uh, perceive them as a problem, you know, that uh, they are just an obstacle to a more modern uh, waste management system, uh, so they just try to get rid of them. Uh, they see, uh, especially at the local level, uh, they see uh, scavengers as a, as, a, as a problem. And uh, over the past 20 years, I've tried to uh, change this. I've tried to tell, you know, academics, uh, development organizations, and uh, authorities that the informal sector can actually be a, a resource. It can be an asset can be a uh, part of the solution to the to the problem of waste because especially in um, the situation has uh, gradually improved in, in Latin America uh, but there are some areas like in Africa and mm-hmm. South in South Asia they are still have big big problems many cities in Africa and South Asia uh, all collect about half and in some cases less than half of the waste that is generated and uh, most often, uh, even the waste that is collected is just sent to uh, open uh, dumps. Uh, there are very few landfills. The, the best way to, to do, uh, dispose of waste is through sanitary landfills, but they are expensive. And so uh, low-income countries cannot afford uh, to build sanitary landfills, or there are very few. 
So the situation, mm -hmm. especially in, in Latin America, has improved gradually. But there, uh, Asia and uh, South, especially South Asia, uh, India, Bangladesh, uh, and, uh, Pakistan have uh, still a lot of uh, uh, challenges, uh, as well as uh, uh, Africa. Th that's where the um, most serious challenges are right now. Yeah, and it's especially great to hear the context of how the problem has changed over time from before being concentrated in Latin America to now being more of an issue in South Asia. And I think one of the key pieces of insight here that it, that is important to recognize is when it comes to informal waste management in relation to the plastic pollution problem as a whole, well, over 60% of all the waste we generate, it comes from developing countries in South Asia. And oftentimes, like you mentioned, if the waste ends up going in open dumps, well, that's where there's the greatest risk of, say, plastics in entering the environment, whether that be in rivers or oceans or just on the land. So this really is a huge problem when it comes to the informal waste management sector being related to plastic pollution as a whole. Yes, yes. The, um, uh, well, the thing, the most important thing to remember is that uh, the informal sector reacts to, to market uh, forces. So uh, they, uh, if they make money, if they can make money by recovering paper, metals, they, they, they will do it. You know, they do it because they make money. They don't do it because it's good for the environment. I mean, they, uh, they are glad, when I, when I talk to m uh, many of them, they are glad that they are contributing to a cleaner environment, but, but they, their main motivation is money. They can make money, they can uh, survive, they can, in many cases, they can uh, support their families. So if uh, a particular material is demanded by industry uh, or any other activities, the, and if it makes economic sense, they will recover it. So one of the main challenges for of plastics is that uh, it's uh, low value. There is very little demand, industrial demand for some plastics. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on the kind of plastic. There are hundreds of types of plastics. So, uh, uh, for, for example, one of the most common is PET, the clear plastic that uh, usually water bottles are, are made of. So PET is very easy to recycle. And it's, there is usually strong demand in many countries, in many developed countries, there's usually strong demand for PET. So you can see people on the streets or in, in uh, dump sites and landfills, uh, scavengers usually recover PET. The problem is that with other types of plastics that are, have very low value, or there are also some uh, plastics that are called thermoplastics that are not recyclable. So the challenge, one of the main challenges is to find ways in which the private sector or even the government can stimulate demand for this other, uh, for low value plastics. For example, to find ways, like, uh, like in India, they uh, they are using low value plastics to for as, as paving material or to, uh, for roofing or construction material. This uh, kind of, um, we also need more research into this. Uh, how how to uh, revalue, how to add value to plastics so that they can be recovered by the informal sector and then, you know, close the loop. It's, it's really important to close the loop, uh, especially on uh, plastics. Yeah, definitely. And um, to paint the picture here, it's like if these plastics, these uh, waste materials, they end up in open landfills. Well, as you mentioned, the informal recyclers, they're pretty efficient at getting these plastics or any other waste out of the landfills when they do collect the waste. But if they don't have the incentive to collect the waste, because as you mentioned, it's low value, well now the waste stays in the open landfill and now it's open to say, uh, being washed away into rivers and eventually entering the ocean. So this in incentives problem is key there. And on that note, um, are there any other problems in informal waste management economies that still need to be improved? in the next five years because you talked about the incentive side of things and the uh, environmental impacts but i know there's also a lot of focus on the livelihoods of these informal waste pickers as well and their health and all the other issues that they deal with on a day-to-day -day. Uh, yes so there are these uh, economic issues you know issues of demand 
the, uh, uh, trying to stimulate demand for uh, low value plastics. There are uh, policy issues uh, in terms of uh, understanding, you know, the informal sector eh, and how it can contribute to, to improve uh, waste management in the developing world. Uh, there's also very important health issues because they, um, many of the people, uh, many of the scavengers uh, work at the disposal sites at open dumps and landfills. And uh, if you visit some of these uh, disposal sites, especially the open dumps, it's, uh, they face really high risks to their health uh, because uh, these dump sites uh, create a lot of um, toxic, um, toxic uh, liquid, toxic gases. And uh, in, in these people are there, you know, seven, eight or even more hours a day. And you can imagine the um, the impact that this has on their health. They are also often uh, uh, smoke coming out of, of the ground when um, uh, because of the heat and the decomposition of organic waste. So all of these these gases and toxic uh, substances can have a serious impact on their health. Um, the World Bank did a study a few years ago in Mexico, and they found that um, uh, Mexican uh, waste pickers working at the dumps had a much lower life expectancy than the general population. That was about at least 10, uh, 12 years uh, younger. So that means that the waste pickers, the scavengers working at the dump sites, because of the contact with the all kinds of uh, uh, garbage uh, of waste, uh, they they had lower uh, um, uh, ten, uh, 10 years, 12 years, uh, cut their life about 12 years. Uh, it, that is impressive. They're also, yeah. if there are communities living around these dumps, uh, children also have a lot of health problems. And it, it, can, it can even have the communities around the dumps can even also have uh, higher uh, uh, child mortality. It has all, all kinds of health issues. Yeah. Um, it really is a very big issue. And when it comes to all of these different problems, um, from the environmental impact of informal waste management to the economic incentives to the health issues involved, what are the main barriers that come up when we're trying to overcome these separate challenges? Well, you know, some of the also another issue that I forgot to mention is a uh, child labor especially in these dump sites, children should not be allowed to work there because of their uh, health impact and uh, uh, instead of going to school, they, 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 they work. So uh, in perhaps the, the, the best example of how to improve their situation is uh, Brazil because they, um, uh, some of uh, many, many Brazilians have, uh, Brazilian waste pickers have organized uh, cooperatives they have created cooperatives. And in many cases, they, when they previously work at dumps, now they work with uh, separate segregation of the source. So they work with in certain neighborhoods and uh, they uh, convince uh, people to separate their uh, waste, let's say, into uh, organic and inorganic, and that helps them. And they have, uh, they got grants or loans from the government or from banks uh, uh, to create uh, sorting facilities. So, in, uh, you know, before they worked in the dumps, but now they are um, basically they created companies to sort the materials, process them, and uh, then sell them to industry for recycling. And that improves their uh, uh, standard of living, lowers the risks to their health, and uh, improves also their earnings. So a combination of creating cooperatives, uh, uh, getting them organized, then participating, creating also um, segregation of the source programs to, to separate recyclables, and then help them uh, to process the, the materials. This approach has had very um, uh, good results in Brazil, Colombia, and, and other countries. Yeah, and as you mentioned with the segregation on source, um, that's very important in terms of avoiding all the challenges with sorting different kinds of materials and um, especially with plastic waste that is multi-layered, um, there are really a lot of technological barriers there that come from, well, in developed countries we get um, a large plastic stream coming into a recycling facility and you have to sort it and there's a lot of barriers there. 
but this can be avoided in developed countries. So it's the, it's interesting for me to note how there are key differences, which of course they like bring up challenges, as you mentioned, with uh, local policies, child labor, when it comes to this issue in developed versus developing countries. But there's also opportunities such as the uh, sorting at the source that can make this process a bit easier. And on that note, I wanted to ask you, you know, we've been talking about these different approaches, for instance, with the cooperatives or uh, the cooperatives to organize these waste pickers so that they can uh, make more formal companies. And then also with the plastic uh, pavements you mentioned earlier, which can create an economic uh, incentive to collect low value plastics. Are there an, any other promising approaches currently being uh, either implemented or studied? that have a potential to make a dent in this issue? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, th- there is, um, in uh, December, I had the opportunity to visit some uh, some of these uh, some of the programs in Indonesia, and they are very interesting programs there, to uh, community-based programs, and also involving, uh, even the private sector in Indonesia is uh, investing in this. They have realized that um, recycling can even be profitable. Uh, I visited two um, programs there where they have sorting facilities. Uh, they hired some of the uh, waste pickers. So now the waste pickers are employees of this company. Uh, they are privately run, two of them that I, that I, uh, that I saw. And uh, they separate uh, manually uh, first into organics and inorganics. Then the inorganics are further uh, sorted into paper, metals, plastics, and so forth. And you know, all, all of this is uh, labor intensive. So it creates a lot of jobs and uh, it's done like they separate the plastics, for example. They separate first into uh, rigid plastics and soft plastics because usually they're, they're different. Uh, and then they are different, the, 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 the kind of plastic that have demand like PET, they're f- uh, further. They they get rid of the of the label and some other uh, some of the of the the lead that is usually of the different kinds of plastic, uh, and uh, so they process them and then they they uh, sell the materials. And in this approach, they uh, they get to this this private company uh, charges a, a pick up fee. They, they operate in a certain area, so people in this in this in these neighborhoods pay the company for pick up, picking up their trash. And then the company takes the, all the trash to this uh, uh, sorting facility and then uh, makes compost out of the organic materials and then sells plastic papers, plastic uh, uh, metals and so forth. So by having these two sources of revenue, uh, it's they are profitable. So these uh, approaches can make money to the uh, to private investors, and there's uh, more and more interest uh, and and Indonesia of uh, following of uh, replicating this approach. Yeah, that's very interesting to hear and promising to see the uh, new approaches actually becoming profitable, so that they have the not only the social impact uh, as a reason to scale, but also the economic incentive to actually make sure that. You know, at the end of the day, these waste pickers, they can make the profit that naturally aligns their incentives with tackling more and more of this issue. And when it comes to tackling more of this issue, um, the last major question I had for you is, well, you have a very unique perspective on the plastic pollution problem as a whole because of these over 20 years that you've looked into informal waste management. And I wanted to ask you. What are the most promising areas of this problem, whether it be specifically informal waste management or the plastic pollution issue as a whole, that more people need to be working on? So yes, uh, the problem of plastics, especially plastics in the ocean, is becoming is getting more and more attention. So we need to uh, a two pronged approach, in my opinion. Uh, one, doing because all of the plastic in the in the ocean comes from land, originally from land, from inefficient uh, waste management programs on land, especially developing countries. The, the, the countries that contribute most uh, plastic in the ocean are China, uh, Indonesia, the Philippines, and uh, developing countries, other developing countries. So uh, you need a double up, up approach. One, to improve waste management on land so that less uh, plastic ends up in the ocean and uh, 
then you also need another approach that, uh, and for this, to improve waste management on land, you, um, uh, the informal sector can be part of the solution. Uh, and uh, on the second needed approach is to uh, to recover plastics on the in the that is there are already in the ocean, and that is a, a more complex issue. There are some um, people working on this, trying to find out ways to harvest some of the some of the plastics in the ocean, and is I think we need more effort, more research on how to do this at a, uh, you know an, an, in an, an efficient way uh, so that uh, we can get get real because in, there are some uh, a lot of risks especially to marine life that uh, consume plastics so it is it's, 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 it's a, it's a problem but I don't I don't think for the for recovering plastics from the ocean uh, I don't think the informal sector c could contribute. I may be wrong, but I think we need it, we need a uh, we need a lot more interest, more research in this area. Yes, definitely. And I like what you highlighted about um, targeting the issue from the root cause, which is preventing the flow of plastics into the ocean in the first place. And you know, as we mentioned, with uh, infrastructure like open dumps, there's a large risk of that. So. This is why like, it makes sense to prioritize working on improving the waste management systems in these countries, uh, in, the South, in the developing countries, especially in um, South Asia. And of course, um, the, there's a variability between the different countries, but given the prominence of informal waste management in all of these countries, it definitely seems like uh, a big part of addressing the problem. And so finally, uh, where can people learn more about this issue and your work on it? Oh, on the informal sector? Uh, well, I would, if uh, if they have the time, uh, I would recommend my book, the book that I wrote in 2007. That is, uh, the title is uh, The World's Scavengers, Salvaging for, for um, Sustainable Production and uh, Consumption and Production. I think that's, uh, that covers uh, a lot of these issues and mm -hmm. presents a historical analysis of uh, how recycling was done in, you know, in the Roman Empire or the Aztecs of Mexico or the, the 19th century uh, Europe, uh, the U.S., and then some contemporary analysis of uh, uh, good practices in Asia and Africa and Latin America. I think for anyone interested in this topic, I would recommend the book. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. And I know there would be lots of insight to be gained there. So thank you for sharing that resource and in general, this uh, amazing conversation and going into all of the details that are coming about that make this issue more important than ever. Oh, thank you. Good luck.